All right. Hey, if I could, if I could get um, the seniors who are going to be participating in a little bit of Q&A really quick, just go ahead and grab a stool over there and come up and bring it on this stage right here. Grab a mic down here. We're going to do just a little bit of a panel with our seniors, some of our seniors here, before Maria brings us an awesome message from God's Word as we continue to highlight our seniors. And so, man, we've, we've asked some seniors to come up and share some things with us, and so we're excited about that. Uh, we got mics right here. Perfect. You're gonna, we're going to pass them around a little bit, okay? So, yes, you can share. That's perfect. All right. Well, hey, seniors, thank you for doing this. It is not a easy thing to get up in front of your peers and be grilled and ask questions. Uh, and so for you guys, y'all just answer. I'm not going to call on you. If you have a great answer, great. If you have want to wait for some other questions, that's great too. So we're going to start off with what's the worst thing that you did in high school? No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. We're not going to go that route. They were... They, I can't. Um, now, hey, in all seriousness, I'd love to start out with just, man, as you guys, y'all are some of our students that have stuck out over the years in high school ministry and made HSM and really being at Bentry a priority. So for you seniors, like, what about that are you grateful for? And like, what parts of that were hard? How did you navigate that in your own experience as a high school student? Um, I think for me, I think the best, the, the biggest thing I got out of it was being able to have a godly community of people around my age because I feel like it's so easy in today's modern world to get really boggled down because there's a lot of anti Christian things that we run into in school and on the internet. And it's really hard to remember that there are other kids out there that are just as fired up for Jesus as I am, and HSM and student ministries as a whole has always been a place where I know I can get that, and it's very refreshing. Um, I mean, it is difficult because it is, I'm, I'm pretty much at the church all day on Sundays, but I'm not mad about it. Um, as busy and as intense as it seems, it's honestly very refreshing for me at the end of the day. I mean, there are times where I'm like, oh, I really can't go because I have to work on this school assignment and things like that, but it's, I, I definitely am very glad that I made this a priority in my life because it has, it always livens me up, especially as I go back into school on Monday morning. Yeah, that's so good. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, for me, mine's kind of similar to Anya's. Um, I, by being consistent, I found a lot of community at HSM. <laughs> and sorry, I'm just a little tired from that song. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, You're me. Yeah. Um, I found a lot of community, and it's made, like, high school be so much better because I didn't have a lot of community freshman, sophomore year, and I didn't go, I didn't start being consistent until, like, halfway through sophomore year, so I've been able to find a lot of friends that, like, have helped me um, stay, um, to pursue, like, Jesus in my uh, faith walk. And then what's been hard is there are times where I'm, like, I have so much school I cannot go, and then there are times where I wasn't, where I didn't go because I'm, like, if I go, I'll fail the class. Like, I kind of had to go. But um, by pushing through even whenever I was tired, um, it's just, it's really made an impact on me, and it's just helped me realize, like, Anya, like, I didn't realize that there were other people who, like, love Jesus as much as I did, so it's been awesome finding those people here. That's good. Yeah. Um, also, godly community, obviously. Um, I met some of my absolute best friends here, and, like, I could not be more grateful for that. Um, but it also helps me, that godly community helps me stay motivated in my faith, and, like, it helps me stay on track, because they can keep me accountable, but do it in a loving way, which is so important. Um, so, yeah. Uh, like everybody else has said, the community, but also the guidance from, like, Brandon and Colin and my small group leaders, Nick and Larry. Uh, to me, it's just been, like, invaluable to my faith. I wouldn't be where I am in my faith without them. And without HSM, I wouldn't have had them. So That's good. You guys all have mentioned a similar thing. You'll use it somewhat in the same word, community. And y'all talked about community and the community here at HSM. When you guys, let's go a little deeper with that. When you think about small groups, 
So like not just coming to HSM in this large group setting, but when you think about when you break up and you go to small groups, what kind of impact and difference has that made in your life? Like what are the things about those small groups that you're like, yeah, that was worth it? Like in the midst of, because you guys are kind of busy, right? Like you guys would say you're busy, right? So like what about those small groups where you, would you sitting here today as a senior say, oh, that was worth it. In the midst of busyness, my small groups were worth it. I wish. <laughs> the leaders, let's go. I was basically going to say that, just like the safe place, safe place that your leaders like provide. And like, it's hard to lie when they ask you every single week, are you okay? <laughs> so like eventually you do it's open good. up and you do like have those people to like guide you through things and just, just to talk about things. Yeah, that's really good. I would say it's the ability to dive deeper into discussions with people that are your age, that are going through what you're going through. Uh, just the ability to not only form those close relationships, but also you not well, yeah, use them to help deeper in your relationship with God by learning and seeing different perspectives on what's discussed in the sermon is kind of one of the main reasons that I come. I think just being able to confide in not only the other people in my small group, but also my leaders, and that being able to be confident in the fact that the advice that I'm getting from them is based in scripture, because it's so easy to it's, it's so easy to lose God's voice. And I feel like these small groups and the way that we speak with each other and the way we help each other out is, God, is one of God's ways of speaking to us specifically. That's good. Um, I think, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, I think for me, it's small groups were awesome for me because I uh, was able to have like one-on-one -on -one time with my small group leaders, like shout out to Miss Shannon, Miss Jenny. Um, I've just always felt so much love from them every, from them every single time I come here Sundays. Um, and it's just awesome getting to like talk to someone else. Like I love my parents, you know, of course, but it's, it's fun talking to someone else who's like, like not my parents that I can talk to about other stuff that they might not understand. That's good. That's good. Awesome. Let's change it up a little bit. Um, when you guys think about HSM and you think about the retreats that you've been on over the years, like anything in that realm, what's your favorite memory from one of those? Uh, so what are you about to say? You have a look on your face. Go ahead. So every year at United, we try to do a Cars Marathon. It never works. Oh, no. um, so, th <laughs> so this year, we're sitting in the TV room. We're, we're watching Cars, and Nick tries to <laughs> slide in and say, he's trying to slide in and say ka -chow, but according to him, he forgot whether he says Kachow or Kachiga. And so, and he was wearing socks and the floor had just been polished. So he slides in, hits the ground, and goes, Kachiga, sliding across the floor. So, so I'd say that was my favorite memory from United because that's just what comes up whenever I think about it. Let's go. That's the kind of memories ride. you make yeah. at United. I love it. That's good. That's gold, Patrick. It's good. What else? Anything else? You oh. Okay, my favorite memory is um, my grade has always been pretty close, I think, since high school. Like, we've all had a really good bond. Um, and so my favorite memory is just, like, after every United, we would always go and get food somewhere. Like, so this year we went to Einstein, and, like, I think last year we went to Einstein, too. And so it's just, like, it's just, like, not wanting to get out of the, like, godly community. Like, we just, like, we love each other so much as people and, like, as um, siblings in Christ and, like, just, like, and genuinely, like, enjoying each other's presence. Like, we just, we can't get enough of it, so we make more of it, you know? That's good. <laughs> I'm going to say um, MSM Crud Wars at Pine Cove. <laughs> Those were insane. I only did it, like, one or two years. But, like, you didn't wash the, was it oats? Do we put oats in our hair? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so okay. So long to get those like, out cream. of your hair, like three hair washes, but really fun in the moment. Yeah. It's always fun to get it all in Kevin's beard. <laughs> I love it. 
Sure. Um, so I, since I didn't really start coming to HSM, like, really until middle of sophomore year, I've actually only, only ever been on one fall retreat and one United. Be I know. Because this past fall retreat, I got COVID right before, so I could not go. It's okay. You don't have to explain. It's all right. I know. It's all it good. Sad, you guys. were there in spirit. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, but <laughs> I guess the my favorite parts from the two retreats I've been on in seven years, my bad guys, um, was probably, <laughs> I guess, just... Um, I mean, honestly, talking with my small group leaders, like, I really have loved doing that those two times. That was super fun. And then just being able to play a bunch of nine square. I really did like that. I, the one United, that one, that one was fun. Um, yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, when it comes to, this is a twofold, like, mission trips or serving. So when you think about, like, all of you guys have served, I know, um, but I don't know how many of you guys have actually went on mission journeys over the past years. Um, any of those things, like what kind of impact has, has that had on you and what kind of benefit is, has that been for you as a student and a senior sitting here today? Okay, I have a lot to say about serving. <laughs> this is like my big thing that I want to tell to everyone. If you are not serving, start doing it. Even if you don't feel like, eh, I don't really feel like I want to do it, do it. <laughs> um, obviously, Y'all see me serving up here, but I also serve in kids ministry as a worship leader. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, Jamie does it with me. She's great. Um, and I will be, like, completely honest. When I started doing it, I wasn't all that jazzed about it. <laughs> it's, it it's kind of tough to get up there and try and lead worship when you've got a little eight-year-old glaring at you like you're the bane of their existence because they don't want to stand up and sing and dance, but, you know, that's fine, just please don't talk. <laughs> Anyways, so I was, I really, the only reason I had started doing it was just so I could do something because I hadn't really gotten up and running doing worship up here in student ministries. But I, even though I was kind of eh on it at the beginning, I let myself be just like, okay, God, do what you're gonna do. And it's now become something I'm incredibly passionate about. I, Love those kids. The amount of times they've almost made me cry on stage is actually kind of because they're glaring funny. at you. <laughs> no, oh, okay. Because sure. there, there are some times where they're they're few and far between, but there are some times where I can see them, and you can see like the little wheels in their head turning, and they're kind of starting to get That's this cool. thing that we call worship, and it's yeah. just so beautiful, and I love that I get to be a part of that, and. Yeah, you know, like it's something I've become very, very passionate about of getting to teach these kids about how much, how about about worship and that there are many ways to worship, not just the way that we do it in kids ministry or the way that we do it here in high school. Um, and it's just something I've become incredibly passionate about. And it's all because I said yes to serving there, even though I didn't really want to. So to make a long story short, start serving. It's good for you. Here we go. <laughs> awesome. So good. I would highly encourage going on at least one mission trip. Um, the Nashville trip. Woo! Yeah. yeah, Nashville. That's what I was gonna say too. Yeah. <laughs> Triplets. Okay. Um, we all grew so much closer, like not only with each other but with God. And two of my like closest friends were on that trip. And we've all even like, just like in our small group and all of us, just like. Yeah. Sure. Retweet. Retweet. So I serve in the back when I when I do serve. Um, and round of applause for the tech people. <laughs> okay. Um, and I gotta say, it's I started serving because my friends served back there. So maybe not for the best reason, but I've noticed it has. Dr I feel like it's drawn me closer to God doing like actually serving because I'm gonna be honest getting up at whatever time on a Sunday never feels good so this actually helps to get me out of bed and go to church um, on Sundays and it's helped me grow my relationship with the community here at HSM because it it helps me to spend time with people when otherwise I really don't like hanging out with people so Thanks for all the honesty, Patrick. It's good. I love it. We've all been there. We've all been there. I, one more question for you guys. Um, man, I know for a fact, or I would guess for y'all, 
that there have been times over the years in high school ministry that you've been on the fence or maybe thought about taking a different route when it comes to your faith. Or maybe there's been other opportunities that seemed better. And I would go to venture to say that there's some students sitting here tonight that are on the fence of, like, I don't know if this Jesus thing is worth it. And even more, and also at the same time, I don't know if this HSM thing is worth it. In small groups, being a part of that community is actually better than what the world has to offer me. And there may be some students sitting here tonight that are on the fence of, hey, when I turn 16 or when I have some other opportunities, I don't know if this is going to continue to be a central part of my life. What advice or what encouragement would you give that student? Well, for me... I would say my kind of biggest rough patch that I kind of went through in regards to that was at the beginning of sophomore year because I had a period for six weeks where I was basically stuck at my house because I had recently been diagnosed with a neurological disorder and it wasn't safe for me to go like anywhere. It was like I was a little porcelain doll and it it was a really, really tough time in my life because... I, I, I did spend, when you're kind of stuck at home all the time, there's a lot of time for your mind to wander. And I did have very many, many, many moments where I was just kind of sitting there like, why? Like, why did this have to happen? Why is this happening to me? If God really loves me, why is he making me go through this? But I was, I'm so lucky that I have a very supportive family and people at HSM, like my small group leaders that were checking up on me mm. and that support helped me kind of push through. And even though it is still hard to look back on that period of my life and it is still something that I struggle with, I still have this disorder, it's a lot better now. <laughs> but I, I'm able to look back on it now and see the, the good that came from that experience and how because I had been so absent like, because I have been so absent from community, it made me value it even more and want to seek it even more. And I started going to HSM more consistently. And that helped be, be better for me. I started being more consistent in serving. And that helped me grow closer to God. And I think it's also given me, it's given me an experience that I can use to relate with other people and help them in something that they're going through. It, it also ironically kind of helped me kind of rethink di what direction I wanted to go to through my life. So at the same time that I was kind of doubting God, I also grew closer to him, yeah. if that makes any sense. Yeah. No, that's great. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's great. That's so good. We can all relate to those things. Um, um, okay. Um, I'm just going to say Jesus is where you can find true joy and peace in this world. I mean, I've tried other things, and, like, it doesn't work. Like, I'm telling you, Jesus is where you find joy, um, joy that comes straight from the Lord. And I would just encourage y'all, even if it's, it might be rough, like, I don't know, if you're not having the best time at HSM, or like, I don't know, just anything not going great, like, there are people who love you here, and want to talk to you, and want to help you, like, Maria, Colin, small group leaders, maybe, I don't know, literally anybody, they will, they want to help you, so I would just say HSM is a place where, um, and, oh, wait, hold on, um, I would also encourage y'all, if you want to, start going to, like, 9 a.m. services, or like, 11 a.m., um, I didn't go for a long time, and then I started going, and, like, you really dive deep, like, live and dive deep into, like, a lot of topics, so if you're on the fence about it, I would say, like, definitely go, like, go to the 11 o'clock, like, you don't have to wake up earlier, go to 11 o'clock, it's all good, like, no shame about that, you know, so you can go to that and, like, really dive deep, and then um, people love you there and want to help you there, but, yeah. yeah. Happiness is fleeting, but joy is forever, and that only comes from the Lord. Okay, yeah, retweet. Yes. Um, yeah, you're close. Um, okay, basically, sophomore year, this person came to my life. Uh, he was a boy, ooh, and I just, I really, I felt the Lord calling me away from him, but I walked in rebellion, and it bit me in the butt. So, highly recommend listening to what Jesus says, but then, and like, like, it was like really, really bad. Like, I got diagnosed with depression after it. I got diagnosed with anxiety after it. I got diagnosed with a lot of things after that. And then literally, I remember, <laughs> I remember in a worship service, um, <laughs> um, my dad was like praying over me. Um, and he like serves in the prayer room. Um, and 
Caleb was leading worship. I don't remember what song it was, but um, we were singing, and then um, my dad was, like, praying over me, and, like, he was literally, like, screaming, um, and he was, like, speaking in tongues, so I don't know what he said, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, he was praying over me, and, like, I literally felt the Lord just dashing through so many things, um, and then the person that diagnosed me with depression, like, told me I was cleared from it, the person that diagnosed me with anxiety told me I was cleared from it, and, like, it was in that worship service that, like, the Lord just completely, like, realigned my mind and, like, um, just refocused me on him. And, like, the, the thing that brought me the most away from God that I've ever been in my entire life, God used that. Like, God will use your pain, I promise you. And he, he used that to, like, bring me closer to him and realign my focus on him. And, like, even though, I don't know, like, even though, like, it was so awful, like, going through that, like, at the end of it, I'm, like, wow, like, God didn't want me in that position, he does not want you to feel pain, but he will use that pain, and he will use um, what you're going through for his glory and for your good. 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 Well, (laughs) on a very different note um so there was a trend for a long time where uh i would especially in msm i would come and then i wouldn't for months on end and then i'd show up for maybe two and a retreat i never missed a retreat <laughs> <laughs> and then i'd not show up um and this kind of started rec- happening again in HSM where, especially toward the end of the year, I would just stop coming. And I realized that I wasn't really doing anything. Like there was no reason for me not to come. So, and there were plenty of reasons for me to come. Like, so kind of when I looked at it like that, that it is, it's, more valuable for me to be here than for me to not, then I kind of started showing up again. So, yeah. That's good. That's good. That's good. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you all so much for being willing to be up here. And let's give them a round of applause just one more time for coming up. You guys can take a seat. Thank you all. All right. Perfect. Well, hey, I'm going to pass it off. Yes, I'll take one of them for Maria. I'm going to go ahead and pray before Maria gets up and gives us a great message from God's Word. And uh, again, seniors, we appreciate y'all for sure. So God, we thank you for our seniors. We thank you for the ways that you speak through people um, and their experiences. And God, as we hear from your word. God, I pray that we hear from that clearly tonight, wherever we're at, even just at the last HSM of the semester going into summer, that you would just convict us, that you would give us the reminder of our identity being in you, that we've got freedom in you, and that we can spend this summer in a way that is impactful and that we experience the love of Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. What number I have in my hand? It doesn't have a number. No. Oh, wow. Uh, hi. hi. There's whipped cream on my table, but I'll I'll be fine. <laughs> Ew, no, I don't know who said that, uh, but no. Um, hey, I want to first address. Uh, I know tonight is long, uh, and for some of you, you're probably going. I don't know who these students are. Why do I care? Because one day you're going to be in their shoes. One day, all of you are going to graduate from high school. And you'll graduate from high school ministry. And so you will be up here. So that's why we do services like this, so that you can go, wow, like that's really cool. What seniors are sharing with you, uh, what you're hearing in videos, what you're hearing from their small group leaders, it should be a moment of encouragement and a moment of excitement. Um, And so it's just a really a really fun thing for us to celebrate them uh, and then for something for you guys to look forward to. Um, And so uh, my time is a little short tonight, which is totally fine, is not a big deal. Uh, For you guys to hear from seniors is way cooler than me um, because they're seniors. (laughs) You guys are sweet. I did not mean that in like a deprecating way. Um, Hey, if you don't have a physical Bible, 
Uh, we're going to take a second. We're going to kind of get loosey-goosey. Uh, if you don't have a physical Bible, you can stand, and we have a bucket up here, and we have a bucket up there. It's not weird. If you've got to stand up to go get a Bible, we're just going to kind of like wiggle it out. Uh, if you do have a Bible already in your hand, uh, you're going to flip to Matthew uh, chapter 23. All right. You guys are doing great. Matthew 23, 2 3. We've got some Bi- Make sure you have a New Testament in your Bible because that would be sad if you just took the energy to go get a Bible and you had an Old Testament. That'd be real sad. I would be sad on your behalf. Yeah, the Torah. All right. Are we all, are we all open? Do we have Matthew? Are we at 23? Cool. Awesome. Yay. Uh, so two weeks ago, uh, Colin preached about gossip. Uh, so hopefully your small groups had some really interesting conversation about how as believers that really shouldn't be a part of our lives. Um, and so tonight, uh, I'm talking about another kind of hot topic word, uh, and that word's hypocrisy. Mmm, <laughs> juicy. Uh, let that word, let that word cook for a second. Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, so tonight is hypocrisy, but before we get in there, uh, I want to talk about what that word is defined as and where it comes from. Uh, so if you have talked to me really for more than 20 minutes, uh, you know that I have a heart and a love for theater. I love theater. I was a theater major in college. I did it in high school. I know. Uh, so I love, I was not an actor, but I love acting. I love acting in theater. I love acting in movies. Any kind of acting, I just love it. The way that people can take on different personas is just like wild to me. Um, I can see, I could go to Broadway and I could see the same actor in like five different shows and just the way that they can like be different people and their physicalities are different and maybe their voices are different. Like it's just so like mind blowing to me and I love it and I take it in. Uh, so back in the day and like pre-Jesus and Jesus's time back in the day, uh, actors would use masks to actually cover up their faces, and that's how they would play different characters. Sometimes even different characters in the same play. Uh, maybe you know that from, like, your Shakespeare class a little bit. Um, they, th- and, like, the masks would indicate, like, who they were, uh, what kind of person they were supposed to be. Like, there was decorative stuff on it. Uh, the formal name for this was actually a Greek word that is when you break it into English, hypocrite. Mm, I know, pretty wild. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce the Greek word to you because that's not my forte. Um, the literal definition of this word uh, is one who pretends to be what he is not. So, like, that makes sense as to why an actor, a Greek actor who wears masks, would be called a hypocrite because they are pretending to be someone that they're not. So at that time, the word hypocrite was actually a term of honor. It was like, oh my gosh, like, oh yes, you're calling me this. It was welcomed by stage performers. However, when Jesus uses that word, it is not a good word. He uses it as a jab to spiritual people, like to the spiritual, the religious individuals. So tonight, We're going to look into Matthew 23, and Jesus, I want to make sure you guys understand this. Jesus is speaking to the crowd, and he is, and his disciples, and he's warning the crowd about the Pharisees. Uh, And he's warning his followers to be careful about who they are following themselves uh, and to be aware of their own hearts. So that's like the goal of this passage that we're about to read. Jesus is warning his followers about these people that they have been following or could eventually follow one day. So I just want to make sure you understand who the audience is and what that context is. So let's look at Matthew 23. So starting at verse 1, then Jesus spoke, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law 
and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. So I want to stop here for a second. The phrase Moses' seat is referring to like a stone seat that would be at the front of synagogues where like the authoritative teacher would sit, just so you kind of know what that picture is. Uh, The Jews spoke of the teacher's seat as like we would talk of like a professor's chair or like somebody who's really noble and high up. Um, Jesus telling the crowd, hey, follow their commands. They, They are teaching the book of Moses. They are teaching what God wrote for you. However, the Pharisees have a very strong fundamental problem. Their hearts are off. Uh, And because of that, they keep adding stuff to God's law. They keep adding stuff to the book of Moses. So he's telling the crowd, hey, don't let the law of God, don't let what God wrote to you lose its authority with you because of what these guys are doing. Like this law is still powerful. God is still doing great things. But don't let what they're doing with it change its power in your life. Continue believing, continue following. So let's keep going. Verse 4, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So the scribes and the Pharisees were bad examples because they expected a lot more of other people than of of themselves. Um, They had really high standards for everybody else, but they didn't keep themselves to that same standard. Uh, And here, what's also really interesting about heavy burdens, if you've read scripture, you know that that phrase is used in a couple other places. So these people are really, the Pharisees are trying to put this heavy burden on followers. But we know from Matthew 11, 30, that Jesus' burden is what? Light. And his yoke is easy. So these religious leaders were what I would what it would be what I would call burden bringers. They're trying to put the burden on you. But Jesus was a burden taker. He's taking your burden from you. It's complete polar opposites. All right, let's look at verse 5. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. So verse 5 is telling us that all the works that they're doing are for men. They acted out the religious spirit that Jesus actually speaks completely against in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Now, there's a couple items here that are mentioned that I also want to make sure you understand because it's always important to understand context when we're reading scripture. Uh, We know the word phylactery. I've had to practice that quite a few times the last couple days. We know the word phylactery from Deuteronomy 11.18. It talks about them in that that verse. Uh, Jews would put tiny little scrolls that had scripture written on them in like these little leather boxes. Uh, and they would bind it to either their head or their arm. And then the tassels that this verse is referring to uh, is a part of their prayer shawl that men would wear. Um, We know that Jesus wore them as well because he was raised Jewish. Now, both of these items were worn as a daily remembrance that they belong to God. And they're wearing them in obedience to what God commanded Israel to do uh, with the covenant at Mount Sinai. So, like, that's the history of these items. Jesus isn't, he's not condemning the wearing of these items because we know that he wore them as well. What he's referencing is the motivation that the Pharisees have in wearing and in showing them, in making them wider and longer, and people are observing them and going, oh, my gosh, your tassels are so long. You must be super spiritual. So they've taken something about God, and they've made it about themselves. And it's not about God anymore. So verses 6 and 7 
continue the like super spirituality that these Pharisees acted out. They loved it when people admired them for their supposed spirituality. They wanted to be the center of the tension. They wanted the seats at the head of the table. They wanted the seats at the front of the synagogue. But not because they actually believed in God, but because they wanted all the glory for themselves. They cared about those titles more than anything. And then Jesus continues in verse 8. But you are not to be called rabbi, for if you have one teacher, and you are all brothers, and do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. So Jesus here is continuing to warn the crowd that they shouldn't imitate the scribes. That he's reminding them, like, hey, you're all brothers. You're all in this together. In verse 9, it's not about the language again itself, but it's about the center of attention that comes with the language that they want. Jesus warns them against giving any, anyone inappropriate honor, anything higher than what they deserve, because we're all the same in the eyes of God. Um, so then verse 11, this is where things kind of wrap up a little bit for this passage. The greatest among you will you be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Normally, people grade greatness uh, by how many people serve and honor them. So, like, how great I am is based on how many people serve me and how many people talk about how awesome I am. I, that's not what I believe, obviously, but that's what the Pharisees are talking about. Um, Jesus reminds his followers in verses 11 and 12 that his kingdom is very different, that his followers should live a very different life, and that we should estimate greatness by how we serve and by how we honor others, not how it is done towards us. Since Jesus truly was the greatest of everyone, he spoke of himself as a servant, which the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they wouldn't get that. They wouldn't understand why would you consider yourself a servant if you are the greatest of all of them. It's really unfortunate that many of the followers of Jesus imitate this type of leadership that the uh, Pharisees had uh, over the style of Jesus. So we can see in these verses two things. One, that the Pharisees want to be seen, they want to be praised, and they don't want to lift a finger. Uh, and that their hearts, it should be hearts, not ears, my bad, uh, are not in the right place. And then we also see that the way of, Je the way of Jesus is in service and, and humility. Uh, so that's, verse 12 is where we're going to stop right here. But in small group time, if you have time, uh, you should read verses 13 to 36. Um, as, you'll, as you read, you're going to go, wait a minute, there's something missing can anybody see it? What's missing? If you just kind of glance, verse 14 is missing. It goes 13, 15 for some of you. So I want to address it because I don't want you to walk out of here more confused than you are just naturally in life because you're teenagers. Uh, all yeah, right. Knee slapper. Uh, so you'll notice that verse 14 is not present in most of your Bibles. It might be in some of them, but in most of them it won't be. Uh, but it should be referenced in your footnotes. Uh, people who are way smarter than me, super, way smarter than me, uh, talk about how this verse isn't actually present in, like, the best and the earliest manuscripts of Matthew. So, like, the, the transcripts that, like, get copied from or get translated from it's not there so we would go okay it's not a part of the original manuscript however at some point people started adding it to Matthew 23 because it's present in the similar passages of Mark 12 and of Luke 20 so people were like well it's in these two Matthew probably just forgot about it so they've added it so I just want just wanted you guys to know because I would be really confused and sit in that, and now you know the answer. Uh, but you can see that each of these paragraphs begins with, woe to you. Uh, these fr the, this phrase expresses anguish. It expresses sorrow, despair, grief, misery. It's just that, like, deep in the pit of your stomach feeling, and you just, 
woe to you. Like, it's, you just, you just feel it. Jesus is feeling these things while giving these warnings to the crowd about the Pharisees. So these are actual things that the Pharisees are doing, and they're in contrast to the Beatitudes. So, like, they're really complete opposites. Um, these woes are also very similar uh, to a set in the Old Testament, uh, to two sets. So the Jews would know about these. So they would hear these and go, oh, this reminds me of the set in Isaiah 5. And this reminds me of the set in Habakkuk 2. So, like, he's connecting it to their culture. He's connecting it to what they understand. The tone in the, those passages and in this one is a tone of condemnation. Jesus is telling them, hey, don't do this. So, as you read them, if you read them tonight or if you read them sometime this week, you're going to get probably a little confused in wording. So I want to just give you a super quick overview, and I'm actually not going to talk through them. I'm going to post them up on, I'm going to post two slides. You're going to take pictures of them because I've kind of condensed the wording of it for you. So hopefully it will help. So these are the first three. So this is verses 13 through 22. Oh, hold on, go back. They weren't ready. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. Next one. And then these are four through number seven. So this is verses 23 through 36. So you can read these on your own time. I just want to help you understand fully what Jesus is saying about the Pharisees. Um, Jesus labels the Pharisees as hypocrites because they're wearing masks and they're deceiving people and they're, they're adding things to religion that shouldn't be there. Uh, this fair, the scribes and the Pharisees were so focused on how they looked and how view people viewed them, they were missing the heart connection. They were missing the peace that connects us to Jesus, and it's the heart. They stopped focusing on God. So when you think about yourself, when no one is looking, what does your relationship with God look like? It's not about what you look like. It's not about what you wear. It's not about how you dress. It's not about what Bible verses you post in your Instagram bio. It's not about how many Jesus bracelets you have. None of that actually matters. It's cool. But what does your relationship with Jesus look like when no one else is looking? And it's just you and Jesus chilling, and you are just sitting there enjoying him, hopefully, and learning about him. I saw on Instagram a quote earlier today uh, that actually said, may your whole life prove that God is good. That's all it said. I, I don't deserve them. And, but like, may your whole life prove that God is good. We know from verses 11 and 12 that the humble, that, that the way of Jesus is a way of humility and a way of putting others before you. But we can be confident in who we are in Christ, that we can remove any masks that we have, uh, that we're wearing, whether it's masks like the Pharisees, where they just keep adding things to Christianity to try to make it harder, because then you have to ultimately fail, which doesn't make any sense. Or are they masks of sin and choices that you're hiding from other believers and from trying to hide from God? Uh, because of the confidence that I have in my identity in Christ, I have the confidence to be honest with God and to be honest with others. That means that I can live a life that is following Jesus without hiding behind masks, and I want to live a life that proves that God is good. So really the question is, what about you? Is that the life that you want to live? Is, is living a life without masks something that you want? Do you want that freedom in Christ? So there's three statements that I believe that we can walk away into small group thinking about. Uh, the first is realize that I am wearing a mask. Here's the thing. All of us wear a mask to fit in. We say things that we hope people think are funny. We wear clothes we hope people think are cool. Now, those things aren't terrible, you know, like, do I wear my United shirt because I think you guys think I'm going to be cool wearing it? Probably. It's also really cute. Like, and we all want to fit in. However, the problem is when I wear a mask to act or to cover up the darkness that's in my heart. We work to hide on the outside, but, but God sees everything in our heart. So then the second thing is remember that I am an influence to others. 
Hypocrisy stands in the way of people coming to Jesus. If that's true, we have to go after it. We can't be okay with our sin and the gap between who Jesus calls us to be and who we are. And then the third thing is, believe that I am able to live honestly. Getting a grip on hypocrisy means that you have to live in authenticity. Being authentic and vulnerable is really hard, and it's really scary, but doing it shines light on everything. And when, a, when light is shown, the darkness just runs because it cannot live. So I encourage you in small group to take the mask off and to talk about these things. Do one of these things hit home for you? Uh, does anything in the first 12 verses of this chapter resonate with you? And also, God loves you, and he freely forgives you when we fail, because I fail every day. I literally fail. Ev- I have probably failed at least 40 times in the last 40 minutes, because I am human, and I am selfish. But God still loves me, and he forgives me, and he knows that the best way to live is through that. And that is what, like, we want you to experience here at HSM is the freedom that we find in Christ and to be fully who God wants you to be. So I hope in small group that you're able to have a really great discussion about this, uh, and hopefully that discussion kind of overflows into after hours as well. So pray with me. Uh, Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you uh, for giving us a space that we can be here together and to learn about what you have to tell us in Scripture. God, please be with us as we continue to go to small group uh, and after hours. Allow this conversation to flourish for us to find and to understand that freedom in you is the best possible life. Lord, we love you, and we pray all in your name. Amen. Amen.